During the past year, I've spent months traveling around Australia and the Himalayas, both with the Sony and the Lumix models. And now I have some thoughts to share. We're going to cover 6K versus 4K, 120p versus 60p, IBIS versus dynamic active steady shot, phase detect versus DFD, menu systems versus dumpster fires, and the joy of a custom dial right there on the top of the camera. What happens when you want to travel super light but still shoot broadcast quality 4K video that you can grade from Log Gamma? How good is the phase detect autofocus system on the Lumix S5 Mark II compared to the Sony ZV-E1? Which of these models has the better stabilization? These are two very different cameras and hence difficult to compare. At the core, we're looking at a 12 megapixel full frame versus a 12 megapixel full frame. So each are built from completely different fundamentals anyway. But if you're shooting 4K video in log gamma and you want an affordable, lightweight setup with a range of excellent lightweight primes to go with them, these two models will go head to head in your research. This is more about video than about photography. So I should state right now that if you're only interested in stills photography, then it's an easy choice. The Lumix S5 Mark II is hands down the better camera in every possible conceivable way. There's no contest. If that's what you came here to find out, you can hit the like button below uh, and we'll see you next time around. Video, however, that's a slightly more complicated story to unpack. I've spent months in the Australian Outback and up in the Himalayas this year shooting with both of these different cameras. I've had genuine issues with both cameras and maybe not the issues you've heard about before. I pushed my gear hard and on these journeys they certainly worked hard for me. So I'm here to share some details on what did work for me and what did not. First thing I need to get out there is a little bit of disclosure on where my biases may lie. I've never been a fan of Sony. I've been burned by their gear so many times I cannot remember. The number one camera we see fail on my workshops is Sony. The shutter box is especially prone to packing it in on some of the models, which is something you don't have to worry about on the ZV-E1 because it doesn't have a shutter box. For most of my career, until about five years ago, I've actually shot with Canon DSLR. They were reliable and they performed. Canon were never too far from the leading edge with their technology, usually keeping a safe distance from the bleeding edge chaos. But they really missed the boat when it came to the mirrorless systems. And I found myself immersed in the Lumix range while Canon were taking a nap. Further disclosure, I have been a Lumix ambassador in Australia for about five years, and they have been extremely generous with me when it comes to cameras and lenses. They even sponsored a photography exhibition I organized in 2019. And before that, I worked closely with them to support a charity in Laos by donating an extraordinarily generous amount of gear to their program. But half of my professional work is running workshops and tours, and I need to be across all of the brands of cameras. If I'm gonna help folks on their journey, I need to be able to understand what their cameras are doing, and especially when something goes wrong. It's very, very rare that changing your brand of cameras is actually going to help you to take a step forward with your creative journey. The camera's not usually the problem. So most of the time, I'm simply trying to help people move forward with the brand they already love. And in case you haven't noticed, there's a lot of people out there who love their Sony cameras. It was time I took a closer look at what the fuss was all about. Once you dig into the Sony range, the only real alternative to the Lumix S5 that comes close to its price point is the Sony ZV-E1, or ZV-E1 if you're in Australia. This camera looks like Sony's best and brightest at the moment anyway. It's got the quality of an A7S III, but with a few newer features and a super cute form factor that's 100% compatible with my travel style. 
for me, it hits a lot of sweet spots, and in particular, the video features are very impressive. The full frame Sony E mount does have a numerical advantage over every other brand on the market for the sheer diversity of lenses on offer, and that makes shopping for lenses just a little bit more fun on the Sony side. Researching the Sony range and trying to work out which model is right for you, that's not fun. They have so many models, it's hard to work out which is full frame and which is not. What I wanted was full frame, 4K 120p and no cropping. The ZV E1 does all that, sort of. Not quite as nicely priced as the Lumix S5, which we'll talk about some more later, but still, it's pretty good. <laughs> One of the issues I see people talk about a lot is the discussion over overheating with the Sony ZV-E1. For certain kinds of production work that demands long shoot days, this model is just a non-starter. For example, when Shelly and I shoot recipe videos in the studio kitchen using the Lumix S1H, we know that camera can be left powered up and ready to roll for hours and hours on end with zero drama. It is reliable. I guess now I can appreciate a little bit better what Lumix have done to make the S1H and the S5 bodies much more studio friendly. The S5 Mark II has active cooling, which is designed specifically to let you keep rolling for long shoot days. But I spend most of my life outside the studio. For travel photography and travel video work, light and small is what I'm aiming for in a camera body. Outside the studio, the Sony ZV-E1 has proved plenty practical. At least in the Himalayan winter, it didn't give me any trouble at all. When I started my trip in Kathmandu, the weather was getting up to 30 degrees Celsius and I'm out there on the street and I'm still getting shots. And the Sony never overheated on me, not once. I do wonder how it might cope in places like the Kimberley region of Australia though, where just a few months earlier, my DJI drone controller had literally melted its circuits while sitting on a beach on a 40 degree day. The Lumix X5 Mark II and the GH6, which I'd done that trip with, they survived just fine. I had zero overheating dramas. It was never even a thought for me. I didn't have to worry about that. The real issue with Sony is not so much the overheating, but the utterly appalling user interface, especially when it comes to custom settings. Switching from one mode to another is painful on this camera. It is a serious negative and a major obstacle to simply getting the best out of the camera itself or getting the best out of your work for that matter. The user interface is so badly in need of a redesign and it lets down all the hard work done to build such great hardware. What Sony have now is a mishmash of half-baked user interface layers with inconsistent tools and screens to find or change different settings. The same setting can have up to three different ways that you can access it, and they don't work the same way. It just doesn't make sense. The ZVE one is probably their worst yet because it doesn't even have a mode dial, and the custom settings implementation on this camera is straight up trash. So there's just absolutely no other way to describe it. If there's one thing I could change on this camera, it would be to delete the user interface. It is a mess. Things like, each time you change the frame rate for video recording, the bitrate setting is dropped to the minimum available instead of the maximum. You might start your day recording at 10 bit 422 at 200 megabits per second, and if you change the codec from the H.265 to H.264, let's say, and suddenly it decides you're only gonna be shooting at 8 bit with 60 megabits per second you have to watch this thing like a hawk. Depending on which user interface you entered the custom setting selector with, you can't see what the settings actually are before you choose them. You've just got a number, M1, M2, M3, and you've got to remember what they are. It's not like you can rename them. Not like you can on the S5 Mark II. <sighs> and then there's things like the AF tracking, which is selected by default if the touchscreen is set to be active. 
And the only way to default to a zone selection instead of the tracking selection is to disable tracking entirely. The user interface is a massive roadblock for the productivity of professionals who actually know what they want to do anyway. But it's also a massive obstacle to beginners trying to learn to get a handle on the technology. How quickly you can get up to speed with a camera is a big deal for beginners. And I don't think enough experts who are giving out free advice are focused on this. We see this on our food photography workshops a lot. We've seen just how effective a well-designed user interface is for beginners trying to switch between two different brands. The Lumix S5 Mark II is an easy camera to get started with and a rewarding camera to master. The Sony ZV-1 is neither of these things. One area where just about any Lumix camera kills the Sony models is the custom settings dial. The S5 Mark II lets you jump directly to any of three custom settings, plus there's nine more filed away beneath the menu ready to be assigned to C3. They've really thought about what makes a custom dial work and the implementation on the Lumix systems is brilliant. You can even assign names to each of the configurations on the newer Lumix models. Sony, however, have absolutely botched this feature on the ZV-E1. For me, the contrast between the two systems is just painfully stark because I know from years of experience just how valuable a functional custom dial really is. The custom dial is also one reason I avoided taking a serious step towards Canon's mirrorless systems. The Canon R5, for example, has done away with the conventional mode dial entirely, so you've got to hold one button down and roll the dial at the same time. <sighs> They've actually undermined what makes that mode dial effective. Whereas Lumix have turned theirs into a library of treasures. Once you master the custom settings on the Lumix system, it is very hard to drop back to something like the R5 or the ZV-E1. Now we've got to talk about autofocus. This is one area where the Sony ZV-E1 really, really shined. It's absolutely superior to the S5 Mark II. Shouldn't be too surprised about that, given the S5 Mark II is Lumix's first dabble into the phase detect technology. One of my favourite things to do when I'm in Bhutan is to visit a temple festival where the monks dress up in masks and flowing costumes and it's super wonderful stuff to photograph. These festivals are a huge test for any autofocus system though. With lots of people in the frame to confuse tracking, people moving in front of each other, and fast paced movement that challenges the speed of your lens and camera. It's not easy for video work, and on my summer visit to Bhutan, I had all manner of trouble getting my Lumix S5 II to stay locked onto a subject, or to keep pace with monks spinning towards the camera. On my winter trip to Bhutan with the Sony ZV-E1, that camera was not phased at all by these challenges. My highest frame rate for video on that camera that I was shooting was 100p, and the tracking worked fine in that mode too. I might add, in general, the AF simply behaves a lot smoother on the Sony. It's much more confident. I've had issues with DFD pulsing under specific situations on the S5 II. I like to shoot my footage at F2 or faster with the help of ND filters. If you're working at F4 or F5.6, you simply may not notice these pulses and it may not be an issue for you. So while the autofocus system on the Sony definitely gets in front, stabilization is where Sony absolutely struggles. Yes, they've got some good technology in the ZV-E1 and I've seen a lot of people saying how much better it is compared to other Sonys. But this technology comes at a cost. At each level of increased stabilization in the Sony, it's just a heavier crop using digital correction. And cropping my image for any reason is not going to make me happy. I want the exact same field of view for my stills and for my video. I want them to match up. I don't want to lose 5% or 15% or 35%. Whatever. I don't want my image cropped. 
Lumix have been way ahead on stability for a long time and it really shows. So much of the Sony stabilization comes down to some of the trickery in camera and you do get blurry frames as a consequence of that technology. The Lumix stabilization also just looks a lot more fluid and a lot more organic than the Sony does. When it fails to keep up, you get a more gentle failure. The Sony just goes jaggy and jittery and you sit there wondering if the footage will even be salvageable in post. I've seen a few other YouTube channels suggesting turning off all but the most basic of stabe inside the Sonys. And I totally see why they give that advice. If you're pretty good at being smooth with your camera footage in general, you can get good results on the ZV-E1. But if you're relying on the camera to do the work for you, you're going to struggle to get useful footage. Autofocus and stabilization are the main two issues in play when comparing these two cameras. The third big issue for me is cropping from full frame. If you shoot everything at 25 or 30 frames per second, then the only reason to choose the Sony versus the Lumix will be whether stabilization or autofocus is more important to you. But if you want 60p or 120p slow motion, things start getting a little bit more complicated. For a start, the S5 Mark II doesn't do 4K 120p 10-bit 422. The ZV-E1 does. At least in most regions, you are able to download a feature upgrade that activates that on your camera. Kind of weird. But even in 50p, the Lumix crops to APS-C, while the Sony does not. But, as we mentioned earlier, the stabilization in the Sony is cropping your 4K regardless of frame rate. Dang. So you can shoot 4K 120p on the Sony without a crop, so long as you didn't want stabilization beefed up in the camera. There's a few other considerations that lots of folks talk about, but I think are maybe overblown. Color science, for example, I shoot in log gamma and I find the Sony does just fine, no complaints. The V-Log on the Lumix is definitely my gold standard, but the Sony S-Log 3, it's also pretty good. The ZV-E1 has a unique feature called clear zoom that lets you seamlessly move between full frame and APS-C crop as though you had an actual zoom lens attached to your camera. This is for video only, not stills. The rocker switch for that happens to be located exactly where you might expect the on-off switch to be. So for me, that was just a total pain in the ass, more times than I can remember. Finally, the Lumix S5 Mark II gives you 6K capture instead of 4K, if you want it in 10-bit V-Log no less. That's actually a really, really nice bonus and I think far more useful than a fake zoom button because you can just zoom in post. Easy. Both of these cameras have dual ISO circuitry, although they are tuned to offer very different benefits. The Lumix S5 high circuit kicks in around ISO 4000, which makes it great for things like when you're shooting auroras in the Arctic. I did a video about that already and you can watch the link on that above. The Sony ZV-E1 second circuit makes an appearance around 12800, much, much higher ISO. That's great when shooting in the worst possible light, but if you find yourself pushing towards 12,800 without actually hitting 12,800, you can end up with a ton of noise and zero benefit from all that extra hardware. So you have to watch the ISO closely and essentially jump to 12,800 instead of creeping up on it. They both give you comparable runtime on their batteries, both can charge over the USB port, both use SD cards up to V90 specification, although the Lumix X5 gives you two slots instead of just one. The Sony is a tad smaller. It's a very nice camera, but it's densely packed inside that body, so there's not much of a weight comparison. The Lumix is a smidge larger, but has active cooling and an actual viewfinder. That's kind of nice. The Sony ZV-E1 does not. The flippy screen on the Lumix is way better too. Both cameras fit easily into my Peak Design 10 litre sling when I'm on the road, so that's no problem. I'm happy with either of them. I always carry two camera bodies, so yes, when I say they fit in my camera bag, I mean 
two of them will fit in my camera bag, the Sony or the Lumix. For the most part, I really enjoyed this little Sony and enjoyed my time on the road with it. Most of the time I was shooting with the Sigma 35mm f2 and the 20mm f2 primes. They are great little pieces of glass and a good match for a camera of this size. I also use the Tamron 20 to 40 millimeter f2.8 for a few days and that's an excellent option for video work on the E-mount. Tamron also lent me their 35 to 150 millimeter f2 to 2.8 zoom lens, which is a really unique combination. And I needed that extra reach when we're doing festivals. The majority of the festival footage that I'm showing in this video was taken on that particular Tamron lens. This combination was killer good. It's a shame that Tamron don't build this lens for the L-mount because I definitely get that one for my Lumix S5 too. But that said, the L-mount lenses, there are some fantastic L-mounts out there and there's a particularly good range that's been brought out by Panasonic, which is the S series. Uh, they're mostly F 1.8s, they're primes. There's like an 18 mil prime. There's a 24, 35, a 50, an 85 and something new coming out soon. These are fantastic lenses. They are so light and so small and they deliver and they are affordable. They are great value. I love those prime lenses. The L-mount does have lots of great options. And if you're shooting manual focus, there's even more options out there with brands like Lauer and you can mount any of your EF lenses, whether they're autofocus or not. One thing that did surprise me on the ZV-E1 is how good the Stabe works when shooting stills. I captured lots and lots of rivers and waterfalls during my travels and the Sony allowed me to drop down to one fifth of a second handheld and still get most of those frames pin sharp. It's not like one in 10 is going to be sharp, but that's okay. I'll just take a bunch of shots. It's like nine in 10 were sharp. So that was a really good result. But that's one of the advantages of shooting with a 12 megapixel sensor and that's not really comparable on the still side to the 24 megapixel that's in the Lumix. And not only does it do 24 megapixel, but the Lumix will do 100 megapixels if you're shooting on a tripod and use the high res mode. I'll have to make a video in a few months time and see how I feel about spending two months in the Himalayas and only having 12 megapixels of stills to show for it. Is 12 megapixels enough for stills? The jury's out on that one. The biggest lesson for me though is how much impact the user interface makes on the ability of a photographer to do their work. Sony deserve a full on kick in the nuts for persevering with that utter trash they call a menu. They've come a long way with their camera hardware, but the user interface is an absolute mess. If you're already used to the Sony cameras and their way of trying to get through the menu, then you may not even realize how much of a burden it's putting on your workload. And if you're not changing from one shooting mode to another, then maybe the custom settings is not a problem for you. If you're new to photography, then for the love that all that's good in the world, please start with something sensible and intuitive like the Lumix. I hope this was a useful deep dive into all the things I love about these two cameras and some of the things that I don't. Please show some love by hitting the like button on this video. And if you're new to my channel, I'd love to have you subscribe and maybe the next video will pop into your feed somewhere down the track. Have a great day.